Romans 8. It's quite a well-known portion of Scripture as well, and I think a lot of people read it. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Because we do not know what we pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with the inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Church, this is the word of God. That is nice. Thank you, church. My name is Vesejo, and I have the privilege of uh, serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City. And this morning, I have the privilege of uh, sharing God's word with you. Uh, we are in a series titled um, Resurrection in Your Life. This is the second week. This is the third week, sorry. We've had two weeks prior. If you missed any of those in the last two weeks, feel free to catch them on YouTube or your favorite audio uh, platform. What we have covered so far is that in the first week, we looked at the events just after the resurrection. We looked at what those events meant, and we saw the people that were in those in that time, we saw their hearts set on fire, and we came to understand that we too should have our hearts set on fire because of that. Last week, we looked at the nature of Christian hope, and as I said, uh, if you missed any of these, feel free to catch them on your favorite audio podcast platform. So this morning, we're looking at Romans 8. Uh, we're looking at a big theme, and it will show us a big theme that's across the whole Bible as we look at Romans 8. And as we look at Romans 8, we're going to look at three specific points. We're going to look at the theme of Exodus, we're going to look at hope, and we're going to look at liberation. So those are the three things that we'll see as we engage this text this morning. We'll see the theme of Exodus, which is similar to uh, Romans in that it paints the whole Bible story picture, and then we'll see hope and lastly, liberation. So let me pray for us before we get into God's word. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can gather as your people, and we pray that as we do so that you would um, calm our hearts, calm our minds and spirits, enable us to come and meet you, that we would hear you speak, that you speak through your spirit. We pray against any distractions, and we pray that you would enable us to hear your voice and be changed by your voice. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we get into Romans 8, it's important to understand where we find Romans. Romans as a letter is written by Paul. And it's an introduction of himself to the church in Rome. So the main theme of the letter is righteousness. And as a book, it can be broken up into four main parts. Um, so you'll see a slide here behind me that will show you the four main parts. Specifically, I want to speak about the first two parts. Uh, because they build that initial context into where we will be. So chapters 1 and 4 introduces Jesus Christ, the risen king, and introduces the gospel, which is the power of God to save through Jesus Christ. That's what we see in this, those first four chapters. 
Chapters 5 to 8, you can think of as a new humanity that Jesus creates. This is from God's, God's law. We see God's law, the Torah. We see the commandments being constantly broken. We see the commandments as a way for God, the way that God wanted his people to live. But, but we also see a, dem a demonstration that out of their own, they're not able to keep this law. Then comes Jesus who dies and is resurrected. Through this resurrection, through his resurrection, we are justified through faith, meaning we are declared to be right with God and to be part of God's family if we are in Christ. So that is what we see in this first four, uh, those first eight chapters. And this morning in particular, we're looking at chapter eight. We will see liberation in the midst of brokenness or groaning. So let's get into it. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we will see the whole Bible picture as we look through Romans. We'll see snippets and themes similar to the book of Exodus. We will see brokenness similar to patterns in the book of Exodus. We'll see the people of God suffering and groaning. And in Romans 8, we see Paul then speak about the need for a Savior who was foretold to come to save everyone and to stop suffering, to bring about redemption and bring about liberation. We see this again as a pattern of the Bible and theme in Exodus. Let's read verse 8. For I con verse 18, sorry. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits for ant with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. So Paul starts by highlighting some truth about this current age, that those who live in this current age are subjected to suffering, subjected to pain, and subjected to disappointment. It is true then of that context, and it is true of our context now. And it was true of Paul as well. Paul too suffered. Paul faced pain, faced disappointment. We see that in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24 to 28. So five times I, I received 40 lashes, minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Galilee, the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers... In the wilderness, dangers at sea and dangers among false brothers. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Not to mention other things, there is a daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. So Paul too faced difficult times. Paul too faced suffering and disappointment. We too experience sickness, whether mental or physical. We too experience personal loss of loved ones, loss of material things, whether it be a job, um, opportunities, businesses or money. We may struggle with addiction, whether through substance abuse or fornication. We too suffer and struggle in this age. We saw Paul's suffering in the words of 2 Corinthians, which we just read. Romans has, has themes similar to Exodus. Trace, Exodus traces or links to a time when Israel's people, when, when Israel, God's people, entered Egypt as guests of Joseph and ultimately to a time when Israel was delivered from the king of Egypt who had enslaved and caused the people of God much suffering. The conditions which Israel faced were tough to put it mildly. They faced oppression from Pharaoh and wandered in the wilderness, not quite the same as spouses following their partners in a shopping trip, um, but they suffered over 40 years, not like the 40 minutes that a spouse would feel walking around the mall with their partner. So for 40 years, Israel wandered in the wilderness. They had bread from heaven, they had water from a rock, victory over those who tried to destroy them. 
they groaned and grumbled. Paul here in Romans 8 includes us in the suffering of this present time, but he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop only at the suffering. He offers hope. And we see that in verses 18 to 21. That suffering of this time is not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed. Paul is saying here that whatever suffering we face is momentary. We must not give up because of the suffering. We will be set free from bondage, set free from suffering. Paul speaks about a glory that is coming, that is worth all the suffering, glory that will bring about freedom. Why is he so confident that this glory is coming? That's a great question. I think we find that answer in the scriptures. Let's first look at verse 19. For creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. To understand the confidence of Paul about this coming glory, we need to unpack verses 19. What does Paul mean when he says, for creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed? I think this means what we shall be is hidden, we being those who have a relationship with God. Sons of God here refers to the collective male and female. But it refers to those who have a special relationship with God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God. So those who are led by the Spirit of God have not yet been revealed and are hidden. We are weak and perfect like the rest of creation. We are subject to suffering and pain. We don't have our new resurrection bodies yet. The day of glory has not come yet. We see also that Paul personifies creation when he speaks in verses 19. It says, creation eagerly waits for the sons of God, similar to how we may look eagerly at our phones on the 25th of the month, eagerly waiting for that SMS to pop in. Or like our children would wait at the door waiting for their parents to return home. Or maybe even waiting eagerly for the sound of the water, knowing that the dishes are being handled. <laughs> so Paul mentions this because creation is also suffering. Creation is also subjected to futility. But creation is not subjecting itself to futility. Paul says not willingly. The one who is subjecting creation to futility is not the devil. It's not Adam, but it's God, because the devil or Adam don't bring hope. So there's a hope in that. We must remember that this is because of the fall of man, because sin entered the world. So creation is then subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself would also be set free when man is revealed and redeemed. It is like driving through some streets in Centurion or Pretoria with trees. You will see in this season the leaves falling, trees being ready to shed more and more leaves. Trees withering away, and we know that spring is coming. We know that spring is coming, and it will bring about new birth. It will bring about new beauty. And we may even forget the last season, but we know that it is coming. So the coming of spring should also be a reminder to us. We should not give up or lose hope like our eternal spring, which is also coming. When Jesus comes, we will be revealed because we are spirit-led. We are resurrected with Christ for eternity and we will then have our perfect bodies. Not to experience suffering and pain anymore. Creation itself will also be set free from bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. So the hope that God has in store for creation is to let creation share in and participate in the freedom we will participate in. So Paul's confidence in the glory coming is because of the promise of God that we would be glorified if we are God's children. His confidence comes from knowing that God brings hope even to creation and that creation would be set free from decay. We see the same theme in the story of Exodus. We see Israel ultimately set free from bondage. 
experiencing freedom. So God delivers Israel. And this is also where Paul would find his confidence. In verse 22, Paul brings us back to the sober truth that we must wait for our redemption bodies. He says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. So we will groan until we have our redemption bodies. We will face suffering and brokenness. We will get tired, we may get sick, we may get discouraged. So all of that does not exclude the believers, does not exclude those who have put their faith and trust in Christ. Verse 23 says, We ourselves who have the Spirit as first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. So even Christians will groan and will experience hardship. So what is interesting maybe about this word groan that we see multiple times mentioned in this, in this section of, of, of the text is the word for groaning in Hebrew sounds like the expression you make when you, when you groan. This, the Hebrew word is anach. So it sounds much like when you say ah. I don't know about you, but I, I use that often. When I hear that load shedding is back, when I hear someone in the family is experiencing sickness or ill health. It's that sound you make when you don't have words to express. So this, and the first time this word is used is in Exodus, when the Israelites groan under slavery. So they cry out and God hears their cry. So even Christians will groan in this day and age and will experience hardship. The Holy Spirit doesn't take away the groaning of our bodies fully in this present age. However, the Holy Spirit is a seal and the down payment of our redemption. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of hope as we wait for our redemption bodies. So verse 24 says, Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? We know that patience is a fruit of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is to inspire us with hope continually, regardless of our situation. The Holy Spirit gives us the patience to endure. The Holy Spirit enables our hope. Because we have the Holy Spirit, we have confidence that we will see the glory of God, that Jesus will return as he promised, that we will experience a day when we will no longer groan, when we will be in our resurrection bodies. God hears the groaning of Israel in Exodus, and he remembers the covenant he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob, that God would bless the descendants of Abraham, they would be his people, and that he would redeem them. Jesus comes to redeem us. God hears our groaning, and when Jesus returns for the second time, we will no longer groan, and we will be in our resurrection bodies. So, so why the mention of resurrection bodies? Maybe a different question would be, why is God going to redeem our physical bodies? So there are a few New Testament scriptures that that can help our understanding of why God is going to redeem our physical bodies. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So God created our bodies in the beginning. Sin entered the world, caused destruction even to our bodies and to creation as we have seen. God then redeems us through Jesus Christ. We then have the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. We also know that Jesus will return, that we will have our redemption bodies. So Paul again says in Philippians uh, 1 verse 20, it is my eager expectation and hope that shall not 
that we shall not all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. So the reason we have redemption bodies is is so that Jesus Christ will be glorified. That Jesus Christ will be magnified through our bodies. So think of our bodies as a tool made to do God's work, which he prepared already in advance for us to do. The last passage that sort of gives us an idea of why God redeems our physical bodies, Romans 6 verse 13. Do not yield your members or do not yield the, the, the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life and your members or the members of your body to God as instruments of righteousness. So our bodies need to magnify God. They need to bring glory back to God and do the work that God created for us, already in advance to do, which is to magnify him, to praise him. So Paul mentioned redemption bodies because we can have hope for a day when all hurt, sickness, and pain will cease. A day when groaning will turn to liberation. Groaning will turn to glory. So it is okay to groan and remember when your body was that of a twin, your own self, when you didn't need glasses, when you didn't need to mind that last slice of chocolate or vanilla cake, when you could run a little bit faster, when you didn't need medication to hold your body together. So it is okay to groan. When groaning is replaced with glory, all sin, which at times controls the members of our body, will stop because we have redemption bodies. So Paul uses the language of Exodus, groaning, slavery, freedom, to tell the story of Christian hope, the the future hope of, of humanity, Christian liberation. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Paul says, creation is groaning with labor pains, pains of childbirth. I have two beautiful daughters, and I've seen what the pains of childbirth are as I witness my wife give birth and bring them into the world. A pain that cannot be described, the pain that many women and mothers experience during childbirth. And there's a tension from a, hu- from a new human life that is coming, but this doesn't take away the groaning, the pain. We are waiting for our new redemption bodies. In our wait, it does not take away the pain. It does not take away the groaning. Jesus is the future of the world. His his empty tomb confirms this. His resurrection is liberation. Because we will also rise with him when he returns. We too will have redemption bodies. As Christians... We are post-resurrection, but pre-liberation. God's purpose for us is to raise our bodies from the dead, make them new, make them beautiful, make them strong, make them healthy. His purpose is to make a new heaven and earth where we will live forever free of sin, free of brokenness, free of groaning, full of liberation. That's his purpose. And I have great confidence that if you have put your trust In God, as Savior, as King, as Redeemer, you will reign with Him. You will experience this new world. We will be able to use our bodies to obey God, to praise His name, and He will be at the center of our lives, and we will never be sad again. Until that day, we live in in post-resurrection and pre-liberation. So what then? What do we do as we continue to grow and face the challenges of this world? We know that we're not alone. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit intercedes and prays for us. Sometimes you don't know what to pray for in the midst of the groaning. A great comfort should be should come from knowing that the Father who knows all our hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads 
for us believers in harmony with God's own will. We're not always perfect judges of what we need, and that is when we need to say that all things happen for the good of those who love God. But this does not mean we abandon prayer in the midst of, of the challenges we face. We need to understand that prayer is a Trinitarian act, so we pray to the Father. The Holy Spirit is our intercessor and advocate. Through Jesus, we have access to the Father by the Spirit. This simply means that we can come to God and lay everything that's in our heart before Him. Simply means that we have access to the Father and that the Holy Spirit intercedes and is our advocate through Jesus Christ in his death. That's what gives us access. Again, this does not mean we abandon prayer in the midst of hardship. This means we pray. This means we read the Bible. This means we remain in community. And as we hear and experience God around us, through the people around us, through creation, that we are changed and we become more and more like Christ where we don't pray for certain things because we're groaning or don't have the words, the Holy Spirit intercedes and God searches our heart because the Holy Spirit lives there. God searches our heart and hears the Holy Spirit interceding in line with his will. As we live in post-resurrection and pre-liberation, we live as those who are not condemned. We live as those who are in Jesus Christ and we hold on to the all-conquering love of God. We should have deep, firm and unshakable security in the love of God. If all is taken away, we should not forsake, but trust him, hold fast and be satisfied in him. The words of a well-known song, Cornerstone, a song that, that we sang last week, some of the words say, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. When all around my soul gives way, he then is my hope and stay. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that... Um, we can come to you because of the work of Christ on the cross, that the death and the resurrection of Christ and our full trust in him, he makes a way to build the bridge between us and you, Lord God. That because of this, that we have access to you, that we can come to you, that regardless of what is happening around us, that we can bend the knee, we can commit everything to you and that you hear us and that we can grow. We thank you that as we pray that you hear us, Lord, that you, you do work, that you, you are there, much the same as we've seen just after the resurrection, that you, you will walk with us as you walked with those that were experiencing you through that time. We pray that you would remind us continuously to bend the knee, remind us to read your word, to hear from you. Remind us and encourage us to stay rooted in community, in the midst of groaning, in the midst of suffering or hardship. Remind us to stay rooted to your word. We thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.